good day to you. It's great to be with you again. I hope you're finding this series through Revelation encouraging and uplifting. I hope it's been a blessing to you and as it's been a blessing to me. So, today we want to really look at chapters 8 and 9. I hope you've done your homework, you've been reading through these little bits, the little bits we tell you to, to get on with and to read through. So, I hope it's been encouraging to you and uh, been a blessing. Sorry, I'm just looking at the camera there. <laughs> so, Romans chapter, sorry, chapters 8 to 9 of Revelation. Remember right at the beginning, we looked at this Bible verse, and it says this. It says, While the, uh, write the things that you have seen, the things that are, and the things that must take place after this. The things that he'd seen up to that point was Jesus. The things that were, or that are, in the present tense, were the seven churches, in John's time, and the things that may, will take place in the future. These are the seven churches, if you remember, we looked at this, it's a picture from back in the day. We started with Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. It went through all those, and Colossae is somewhere in between there, just for your references. And uh, we looked at those as the churches that were at that time, in John's time, and he wrote letters to all them. The things that are to take place after this. And that's where we, we're working our way through right now. So we looked at, in chapter 4, we looked at the throne room. We looked at the elders. And into chapter 5, the scroll was described there. We looked at chapter 6, the opening of the seven seals that were on the scroll mentioned in the previous chapter. We got into chapter 7 and we looked at the uh, 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel and the tribulation saints that were before the throne. So we're going to jump into chapter 8 now and see how we progress through this. So, chapter 8 verse 1, it says, Then uh, when he opened the seventh seal, the seventh seal, if you remember, this is the seventh one of the seven, and this is going to lead into seven trumpets. I told you that there's six, then there's a gap, we've looked at that, and then there's the seventh, and the seventh always opens up into another seven things. So we've got the seven trumpets. There'll be a gap between six and seven. And at the seventh trumpet will open up and there'll be seven bowls given. And the, even there's a gap between the sixth and the seventh bowl. It's only one verse, but it's there. So he says, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. One of the questions that's often asked of pastors and Bible teachers is, is there time in heaven? Is eternity just a long time or is it a place without time? Well, according to this John, it says when this seal was opened, there was silence then for about half an hour. So time was progressing in John's concept of time, but God is outside time. God was there at the beginning and is there at the beginning, is with us right now and he's also at the end. To God there is no difference between the beginning and the end. He always is and he's always there. He's with David right now in God's time scale as he is with me and he is with whoever in a thousand years. It's the same to him but in heaven there is a progression of time because this verse says there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. John didn't have a watch on, but they generally had a good idea of how long an hour was and how long half an hour was. You know, it's okay saying how long's two minutes. Well, it all depends on which side of the toilet door you're on. When you're busting and someone said, I'll be out in two minutes. So there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. This is more like the, the quiet before the storm. The six seals have been opened, and that's, that's in a sense, has been a quite an awkward time, an hard time, a bad time. But now the silence because of what's ahead of them. This is a, the next third of sevens, as it were, and it's just going to open up into some horrendous stuff. And so the silence there, because it's almost like a shock that these things are going to come upon the earth. Verse 2 says this. It says, And I saw seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now trumpets is, is often symbolic throughout the word of God. It's a good thing to track down. The trumpet of God sounded when the law was given up there on Mount Sinai. 
where also seven trumpets given are blown or carried and then blown around Jericho in Joshua uh, 6. I have talked to you in the past about the similarity between Joshua and Revelation. And this is another one of them, seven trumpets there. In the Apocrypha, if you are into reading that sort of thing, these seven angels have got names, but they're not really mentioned here. They're only mentioned in the Apocrypha, and it's not the inspired word of God, it's mainly traditions and things like that. So, we don't need to be confused um, with these seven trumpets, with the seven trumpet judgments that come later. And we're not to uh, be confused, sorry, with the seven trumpets, with the last trump of God, which is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 52. And also, there will be trumpets blasted in the millennium as well. So, trumpets are always through the Bible, and they're often blown, but they're usually meant as a, as a sign to something, a call to action, as it were. They used to blow the trumpets to get the troops ready, blow the trumpets to, to get them to go to battle. So, this is a call for action. So, the seven trumpets are going to be blown, and each of them has a call to action in there. So, that's verse 2. Verse 3. Another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden, incense, with a golden censer that, uh, that he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of the saints on the golden altar before the throne. Again, I've told you this is very Jewish now. It's not Gentiles. It's got an altar mentioned. It's got the sense, uh, uh, a, a, a census and incense all going on here. And the prayers of the saints, it's almost indicating that the prayers of the saints that are on the earth at that time are still coming up before God. And he puts a fragrance mixed in there to help God. But it says, and the smoke of incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angels. So he's mixing the prayers now. I don't get how this is, but, you know what I mean, it is what it is. The prayers go before God, the smoke goes up before God and... and um, you know, God answers prayers. It's it's amazing to know that God always answers prayers. And I've been talking to somebody recently who told me that God sometimes says yes and sometimes says no and sometimes says maybe when it comes to prayer. But the Bible tells us that all God's promises are yes and amen. But now and the yes, we're just going to work that through. It's not no. If God says yes already, he's not going to say no later on. So... The prayers are rising up before God and the incense is rising up before God. And then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and threw it at the earth. And there was peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning and an earthquake. There's going to be earthquakes all the way through Revelation. But it's, you, you can almost sense the, the tension that's building. That, that the earth is right ready uh, for the, coming of the, the second coming of Jesus. Not the rapture. We're talking about the second coming, but the earth is ready, but also the fact that the angels want this to be quickly over and done with, and you can get the sense of, of maybe a bit of anger coming across, and he throws it, he flings it at the earth, and there's lightning and rumblings going on, flashes, and an earthquake. Verse 6 says, Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them, I like it, it's almost like they're standing to attention, but... The census has been thrown down at the earth and these seven angels now get ready and they're standing there ready to blow their trumpets. And the first angel blew his, blew his trumpet and they followed hail and fire mixed with blood and they, were, uh, and they were thrown upon the earth. And the third of the earth was burnt up and a third of the trees were burnt up and all the green grass was burnt up. There's going to be hail, hail's always always used as judgment throughout the Bible. Heavy ale coming down. If you get ale outside, it's just the weather. But when it comes to the heavy ale, and especially when it's mixed with fire and blood, <laughs> you know, it's a different sort of ale. And ale's used always from the Bible in Isaiah 28, verse 2, Job, it's mentioned. And even in, the, the, in, Egypt, sorry, even in Egypt, when Moses was there, hail was used. And it's a sign of judgment coming upon the earth. When it says also, just to, something to think about, when it says that and a third of the trees were burnt up, in the Greek, we don't get this, we just think that's a general tree. It's talked about the trees and, and the word there is actually fruit trees. So a third of the few fruit trees, food-giving trees, will be burnt up. 
So not only has been war and famine and plagues, but even when you've survived, this is continuing towards the middle of the tribulation where maybe there it's, it's hard to tell, but um, next couple of chapters we do get an indication of the middle, but it says the trees, a third of the trees are going to be burnt up and all the green grass, there's going to be fire everywhere. Upon, so ale's normally ice, but there's fire mixing, it's going to burn up the grass, which is going to be a bit awkward for all the grass-eating animals. Then the second one blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain of burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the seas became blood. A third of the living creatures in the seas died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. You know, I don't know how many ships are licensed uh, or on the oceans, but a third of them, could be thousands upon thousands of them worldwide, ships going everywhere, and yet a third of the ships are going to be destroyed. That's including fishing ships, cargo ships. You know, this is trade going to continue, but a third of them are going to be lost. If you're sending something from uh, one country to another and it goes by ship, at this time it could be lost. And uh, a great mountain, to us this could be a meteor, and it could be, this could be a straightforward meteor coming in, uh, all ablaze, because at the end of the day a meteor's coming in, it's going to land in the sea, but it's going to turn the sea to blood and it's going to kill a load of the, a third of the living creatures that are in the sea. So not only are a third of the fruit trees dying now, a third of those the fish are going to die and the creatures that are in there. So. A, third, a quarter of, them of the population already died and was from the war, famine and plagues. Now God's going after the fruit, he's going after the sea creatures. If you read, you can see things in Isaiah 2. I need to read this to you because in Isaiah chapter 2 verses 12 to 19, it said a few interesting things. Verse 12 starts off with, For the Lord of heavenly armies has a day of reckoning, he will punish the proud and the mighty and bring down everything that is exalted. Verse 16 says, He will destroy all the great trading ships and every uh, magnificent vessel, or other says the, the trading ships and the, fi the fishing ships. So he's going to destroy the ships that are on the sea. This is in Isaiah, remember. And verse 19 says, When the Lord rises and shakes the earth, his enemies will crawl into holes in the ground. And they will hide in caves in the rocks, and the terror of the Lord will, uh, and from the terror of the Lord and the glory of His Majesty. We've read also earlier on that people are going to hide in caves and ask the caves to cover them up, the rocks to cover them up from the Lord and from the Lamb. In um, where are we now? Let's just keep going on this one. Just there we are. Zephaniah 1 verse 3 says, I will sweep away people and animal alike. I will sweep away the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea. And I will reduce the wicked to heaps of rubble. And I will wipe humanity from the face of the earth, says the Lord. We don't realise that, you know, this, this week, Daniel's week, 17th week, this seven years of tribulation are going to be in horrendous time. And it's God that's doing it. And we're going to get to the verse of why. Later on, now we've, we've looked at the verse for the Jews that it's going to bring the Jews to repentance, but there's also an interesting verse at the end of chapter 9 that we'll look at. So, verse 8, sorry, chapter 8, verse 10 and 11. The third, uh, third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs. The name of this star was Wormwood. And a third of the waters became wormwood, and many people died from the, the waters because they had become bitter. We're going to be, it's an interesting thought now that the, just the trumpet before says so a great mountain, meteor, came flying into the earth and caused all the seas to actually, you know, well, actually, a third of the seas to die. This talks about a star, I want you to be careful, it could just mean another meteor, it could be a, an asteroid or something that just comes flying in, a comet or whatever, it's just an heavenly body that comes in, or, you know, we need to realise that when it talks about stars falling, it's, uh, you know, we look at Satan, he was a star that fell to earth from heaven, and it says, a blaze that fell uh, from heaven, it's not coming from the sky, and yet yeah, it, it still could just mean the whole thing could just be a, a meteor. 
But it's interesting how it says a star fell and where previously it said a mountain. Blazing like a torch. And it fell on the rivers and on the springs of water. And a third of them, well it fell on a third of them. And it actually poisoned them. The name of this was Wormwood. It could be a rock or it could be a fallen angel. It could be Satan himself coming. The name Wormwood actually means bitter, which actually is poisonous. So a third of the rivers are going to become poisonous and a third of the springs. So those people live in those areas and it says many people died because of the waters that being made bitter. That were poisonous. Not only are people going to die because of the water, but the food that was in those rivers are going to die as well. Wormwood, actually, the Greek actually means undrinkable without harm. In other words, if you drink it, it's going to cause you harm. And it's symbolic, or it's synonymous with sorrow, calamity, bitterness. So you get that in Jeremiah and Lamentations and Amos. And actually, interesting, and this came out years ago, that the Russian word for wormwood is Chernobyl. So when the Chernobyl disaster happened, everyone said, it's wormwood, it's wormwood. And this is when confusion sets in because something happens, like when the Twin Towers came down, they said, well, it says this in Revelation. We're not in the tribulation yet. We're still pre-tribulation. So anything that happens cannot be part of the tribulation. At the minute, we've got this COVID-19 going on, and people say, it's the end times. Well, it's the end times if we go through the tribulation. But even if it is we're going through the end times, tribulation thing, there's an order. These are not just random. These are a systematic layer upon layer. This is done almost logarithmic. It's, it's designed. It's got a purpose. It's not just an event that happens and it's, it's there. So Chernobyl was probably just a, a precursor of what it could be. Yeah, it could be a case of it's a nuclear disaster, but it says an angel fell, a star came down and poisoned the rivers. Verse 12, it says, The fourth angel blew its trumpet, and the, third, and the third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so the third of them would not give, um, that their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept shut from shining, likewise, a third of the night. Now, this is a darkness that comes upon the earth. Now, we're not sure if it's meaning that everything's going to dim by a third, or whether there's going to be a third of the night and a third of the day, that's going to mean complete darkness. So eight hours in a 24-hour period, there's going to be um, a dimming uh, of darkness that comes upon the earth. Or it's just basically darkness, generally a dimming of the 24-hour period. We're not quite sure and we'll see when, when it happens. But what we do know, if there's a dimming for a period of time, it will kill the crops. So now we've lost the fish in the sea, fish in the rivers, fruit trees have gone, and now you've got the, the crops, it'd be like a nuclear winter. So it could tie in from the verses before, a nuclear winter's happened for some reason, it's caused uh, a blanket of dust around the earth which dims it, and yet it could just be a natural thing that occurs at a specific time, designed by God, to bring this on. All these things are actually almost natural, done by the supernatural. But well, that changes when we get further on. So the next one. Then I looked and I heard an eagle cry in a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. War, war, war to be inhabited to those who dwell on the earth. And he'll say those the inhabitants of the earth because that's another version. At the blast of the other trumpets of the three angels that are about to blow. Something changes at this point. Because there's not only the trumpets, but there's wars. So as much as it's been bad up to press, the seals were bad enough. The trumpets have got worse, but the last three trumpets suddenly become wars. It's not just a blast of a trumpet. There's war. The term we need to keep in mind is that the term for earth dwellers, or those that dwell on the earth, is never used about believers. It's always used as non-Christians, non-believers. So, war, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth, or the, those who dwell upon the earth, they're going to, you know, for the blast of a trumpet that's going to come, because these guys know something's going to come, but it's coming upon the non-believers, the, the, the unbelievers, not upon everybody else. So, the first four um, trumpets were natural. 
They could be natural, it could just be in events that are supernatural lined up. They often say that about Moses, when Moses was in Egypt and all the plagues came, there were natural plagues. But the fact that he could control them was what was supernatural. These plagues are coming, or these blows are coming naturally, but from a supernatural source. In the first trumpet, a third of the trees and all the grass died. Second trumpet, the seas, a third of the seas died, uh, was turned to blood, and ships were destroyed. The third trumpet, the water, the rivers died, a third of them died, and you know, from the bitter water. Fourth trumpet, the sun and the moon and the stars, a third of them were darkened. And then it says, and finally, the three trumpets are called the three wars. And then we jump into chapter 9. Chapter 9 actually then continues. And instead of having four, we've had four events that are natural, we've got three more. We're now entering into a supernatural time where we've got two demonic armies coming upon the earth. Two groups that come on to kill and to torture mankind. Again, this is actually against the unbelievers, not the believers. God's grace is still working at this time. So chapter 9 now, verse 1 to 3. So we still talk about the angels who are blowing the trumpets. He said, And a, a fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star falling from heaven, falling from heaven to the earth. We've got a star business coming on. We need to remember a star is uh, always fallen, a fallen star is an angel. Look at Daniel 12, verse 3, and Isaiah 14, it's in there. And, uh, and he was given the key to a shaft to the bottomless pit. This is interesting, that the fallen star, some people think it might be Satan, but it's definitely a fallen angel, a key was given to him. This key was given to him by the one who has the key. I'm talking him where we're at. This is God who's got a key, or an angel's got the key, and it gives him the key to open up this bottomless pit. That's why I don't believe this is against believers, but against non-believers. Verse 2 says this, that He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke, like the smoke from a great furnace. A big bellow went up, a big mushroom cloud of smoke went up. The sun and the air was darkened from, with the smoke from the shaft. So at some point, this shaft, we don't know where it is, there's no, you know, it may be, have a location, but obviously it's somewhere, but we don't know where it is on earth at the moment. But it were opened up, and smoke went up. Then from the smoke came locusts. Locusts symbolic, but it's, it means locusts on the earth, and they were given power, like the power of scorpions on the earth. So these locusts that came out, these are actually demonic animals, but they're symbolised in a, in a locust, or they look like little locusts, but they are actually demonic. So the key was given to him, it's personal, it's to a person, and this, whoever it is that's opening up, is a king over the locusts, or a king over the pit. He has authority, but he had to be given that authority. The idea of a bottomless pit occurs nine times in the New Testament and 30 times in the Old Testament, seven times actually in Revelation. And these, you know, if you read in Luke 8, talking about the guy who's demon possessed and Jesus told him to come out and they said, come go to the pigs, they begged not to go into the abuso, into this bottomless pit. Uh, but we do know that later on in Revelation, Revelation 20 verse 10, Satan will be imprisoned there. So all these demons that are in there have been let out, and eventually Satan gets thrown back in there, or put in there. Verse 9, Sorry, verse 4 of chapter 9. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree. So these are not generally locusts that are normal because they eat everything that's green. These are, are locusts that are demonic. But only those people that do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Again, this is not the seal of, uh, of God from the 144,000 that were sealed. These are the believers and that go out, so these go out to actually arm anybody who's not a believer. They were allowed to torment them for five months. Now we're not sure, and there's two different theories about this, that they go out and they can torture people for a period of five months, or maybe they bite them and the pain lasts for five months. So they're out there for five months, but the torment of their sting 
lasts a, pr a further five months after they've been stung. We're not quite sure if it's just a period of time where the sting moment happens for a short time or the sting itself happens for five months. It depends what you read and uh, how different people interpret it. But it says they were allowed to torment the people, these are people without the mark, the unbelievers, for five months, but not to kill them. So they can't kill the people. The people may want to die, but they can't. And the torture uh, and their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings somebody. I've never been stung by a scorpion, but I'm told it's very painful. Uh, wasps and bees don't bother me, but I reckon this one would. And in those days, people would seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from... God will supernaturally stop people from dying. People who will get stung won't be able to die. They'll only be able to suffer for this five month period and they will want to die. People will be trying to commit suicide but will not be able to kill themselves because death won't come near them because God is holding them responsible. There's a reason why this. God is trying to, as many people are dying, God now is trying to keep these people alive to give them a chance. And, and you know, verse 8, uh, so chapter 8, verse 13, when he said, War, 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 to the earth, to those who dwell on the earth, these are not the believers. So these little, I don't know what they are, locusts are going out to torment the non believers that are on the earth. Verse 7, this is they're going into it. <laughs> Their appearance was like, like that of horses prepared for battle, their heads looked like their had crowns of gold and their faces were like human faces. Their hair was like women's hair and they had long hair and their teeth were like lion's teeth. These are horrendous little creatures, aren't they? With little creatures but they're horrendous. They had breastplates and breastplates of irons and the noise of their wings were like the noise of many chariots and horses rushing into battle. In other words, you'll hear these things coming and if you see them, they'll be nasty little critters coming at you and they're able to sting and bite you. This, this is not a nice pleasant thing. And their tails had stings of scorpions. They've got big teeth to bite and they've got scorpions and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. Again we're not sure if that's five months period that they're going to be allowed on the earth or five months of period of time they're allowed on the earth plus a sting can happen and leave them for um, five months thereafter and the king over them this is why we know it's not they are not scorpions it says they're the king over them the angel of the bottomless pit his name when Hebrew were Abaddon and in Greek was Apollyon it isn't just Greek and Hebrew terms it's mentioned six times in the Old Testament and it actually means a destroyer or the prince of the air so there's this angel that's over them it could be Satan or it could be one of his minions, but he's over them. But we know that these are not natural scorpions, because in Proverbs 30, verse 30, uh, 27, it says, The locusts have no king, yet they advance in rank. Interesting phrase, you just throw it in there. And when you read Proverbs, you just read through it and go, yeah, okay. But actually, turn into Revelation, it shows you that these are, these are demonic, because they have a king over them. But we don't quite know the king is, but it's an interesting verse. Amos 7 verse 1, this is when it gets, you really need to dig into this. It says, this is what the Lord showed me, this is Amos. Behold, there was a for, um, forming locusts, locusts, went with the latter groves and just began to sprout and behold, it was a latter groves after the king's mowings. If you read this in the King James, it makes absolutely no sense. The New King James is a little bit better. This makes very little sense. In the New Living Translation, it makes a little bit of sense. The NIV, it still doesn't make much sense. It says, this is the New Living Translation. It says, the Sovereign Lord showed me a vision. I saw him prepared and send a vast swarm of locusts over the land. This was after the king's share had been harvested from the fields as the main crop was coming up. I like that, and I'm not saying this is about the rapture or anything like that, but it's interesting that a swarm went out, if you're tight in with Revelation, the swarm went out after the king had harvested his fields and the main crops were coming up. The reason I say that, because sometimes some of the Old Testament verses, you've got to read in the Septuagint, 
And this is what it says in the Septuagint. It says, The Lord has uh, shown me, and behold, a swarm of locusts were coming. And behold, one of the young devastating locusts was Gog the king. Gog will appear later on in Revelation, Gog and Magog. These are spirits. These are, uh, uh, you know, we talk about the part of Russia and stuff like that. But these are the demonic spirits that are on the earth that have been around for generations, for millennium as it were. And in the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament that was written 300 years before Jesus, they put across this verse as being the locust was the king, the young devastating locust was, was Gog the king. So Gog appears and we'll get into that later on. Don't know what you want to do with that, it's just an interesting thought. Revelation 12 verse 2 says, The first word passed and the old two more wars were still to come. That's bad enough. That's the first demonic army that's gone out. And then suddenly there's going to be another one. It said, this is verse 13 to 16 now. It says, Then the sixth angel blew its trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four arms of the golden altar before God, saying that the, to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound by the river, the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for this hour and day and this month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. This is horrendous. There's four angels that are on the earth at the river Euphrates in a spiritual sense and they are bound there, ready to be released to go kill a third of mankind. Now somebody might say, well this is the third that have previously been mentioned. No, that's against the earth. Yes, many people will die, but this is, the four angels are going to go out and kill a third of mankind. The first demonic army came and hurt people for five months. Those five months have gone, there have been a lull in time, and then the second demonic army comes and kills a third of mankind. So a quarter of the population died with the seals in chapter 6, so in Revelation yeah, chapter 6. And now there's been wars, rumours of wars, there's been all this stuff going on. Sorry, there's been wars, famines, diseases, there's been the hailstone and blood coming down, there's all these things going on. And now these armies are going to be released and it's going to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. In other words, it's 200 million. I don't know why the uh, English standard puts it that way. It is more correct to the Greek. The, you know, the, in the church time, in Jesus' time, 10,000 was a huge number. And 10,000 times 10,000, but it's twice 10,000 times 10,000. So it's not 100 million, it's actually 200 million mounted troops. Now people have said this could be China coming over. But it kind of doesn't fit in with the Kings of the East as of yet. Uh, but I think we're trying to leap at something that's not necessary. Yeah, China could actually raise up with 200 million troops. But I don't think that's the point of the minute. Uh, it says, I heard their number. These are, these are demonic. This is a demonic an, uh, army. Four angels, but these four angels have got all these other mounted troops going out with them. And I'll tell you why as we read on. This is how I saw... Uh, the horses in my vision, they rode, <laughs> and those who rode on them, they wore breastplates and colour of fire, of fire, sapphire, and sulphur. In other words, fire red, blue, and yellow sulphur. And they heard, and the heads of the horses were like heads, were like lions' heads. This isn't a tank, it's not a man, it's just a horse with a, a lion's head on it actually. This is, this is a demonic army. And fire and smoke and sulphur came out of their mouths. We've got to be aware of this. Yeah, John couldn't comprehend a tank and he couldn't comprehend planes and he couldn't comprehend things. So I know he's, he's taking symbolism from his time and trying to put it across. But we need to be careful that, that we don't use it as an excuse to try and fit what John's saying into a time scale of what is today. So, it says that fire and smoke and sulphur came out of their mouths. So yes, it could be a weapon, it could be a blast. And that's great for us, but 200 years ago it couldn't have been because they didn't have real guns, they had odd one and cans maybe, but they couldn't kill a third of mankind with you know, bayonets and muskets. Nowadays we could. 
But this is a demonic army that goes out killing people. Because if it wasn't a demonic army, they'd be able to kill the Christians as well. And it's not the Christians who are being killed, it's the non-Christians that are being killed. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by fire, smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. Um, for the power of the horses was in their mouths and in their tails, so it's forwards and backwards. For their tails were like scorpions, were like serpents with heads. And by, this, and by means they, had, they would wound, not only the killing people, but wounded people. So we've got thousands upon thousands of these things going out, killing a third of the population. It's interesting to do the maths if you think that if you round it up, six billion people are left at the tribulation, sorry, the start of the tribulation after the rapture. A third, sorry, a quarter has gone, so that's 1.5 billion people have gone already, leaving 4.5 billion. Take away half a billion because of the deaths that have been occurring. It gives us down to 4 billion, a third of them, so that's 1.33 billion more people are going to die. The population of the earth is steadily shrinking and people are still not crying out to God. The rest of mankind, this is one of the most interesting verses and one of the most sad uh, little bits in the Bible that we need to get his head round. The rest of mankind, those who had not been killed, uh, that had not been killed by these plagues, did not repent. That's, that's the saddest verse in Revelation. They know who's doing this, because earlier on it says, the hiders from him who sits upon the throne and from the land, they know, sorry, and the lamb, they know who's bringing these plagues upon the earth. The 144 preachers, the witnesses, the, the Jews from 12 tribes of Israel have gone out there and they're witnessing, they're, they're proclaiming the news that, that God's coming back, that God's upset and he's sorting things out and he's going to set up his kingdom. They're preaching the gospel of Jesus to everywhere. People will be without. You know, they can't say they're ignorant to this because the signs will be in the sky and the preachers will be on the earth. Millions of people will have become Christians. Thousands, if not millions of them, will be dying for being Christians. But it says the rest, after all this, the rest of the earth, they were, that were not killed by these plagues, did not repent. They did not repent of their works of their hands, nor give up the worship of demons. They knew what was going on. And we're, you know, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all that's going to come through. The worship of demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which they cannot see, hear or walk. Later on, there is one that seems to come across like that. Nor did they repent of their murders, their sorceries, their sexual immoralities, and their thefts. This isn't the time of the tribulation, but there's so many people getting murdered. The sorcery, witchcraft going on, sorcery. There's also, sorcery could mean drugs, it could mean you know, intoxications. Sexual immoralities covers everything from bestiality, homosexuality, sex outside marriage, it covers all that, and theft. It's just pinching whatever they want, taking whatever they want. So, you know, taking a person as well as taking goods. So it covers everything. Murder, it could be the murdering of children, unborn children as well as the elderly. But we're trying to get rid of people who are old. And they'll be trying to kill the babies, which is what we're seeing these days. Sorcery, so there'll be drug intoxication going on. And sexual morality, freedom to do whatever you want, whenever you want, against whoever you want. It'll be rampant, but it says they did not repent of it. They wouldn't turn away from their own pleasures and put their trust in God. Reason? Because man's heart is rebellious. Man at the core is rebellious. See, we always assume that man generally is quite kind and quite good. But the Bible says that man's heart is, is above everything else, very deceitful, and it's rebellious. And without submitting to God, no matter how good a person is, they are still rebellious at the core, rebellious against God. Because they'll say they don't need God. So that's the sad verses that are in, and we'll find as we read on, it keeps saying, but they did not repent. But they did not repent. And that's sad because God has given them opportunity. That's why for you and for me, we've got a journey, a job to do. Before we're raptured out of here, 
We need to tell people about Jesus so they don't have to go through this. This may happen in the next few years, it may happen in the next 10 years, 20 years, it may happen in a thousand years time. I actually believe it's we're closer now than ever have been, which is quite logical, but I mean, within the next, you know, it could be the next decade, anything could happen. And we need to be aware of this and get people in the kingdom of God so that they don't have to go through this. So for next time, a few, a little bit of homework for you. Read chapters 10 and 11. Have a good read through them. You'll come across these two guys called the two witnesses. Ask yourself, who are these witnesses? I believe they're already mentioned throughout the Bible, but you find out who they are and justify your answer by the scripture, by the Bible. Don't just pick out two names uh, from the Bible, but pick out and know why you think they are. There are several options for this, but we'll get to them next time. And then also there's a thing called the seven trumpets. But, but John doesn't write down what the seven trumpets are or what the purpose of them are. And my question in itself is, well for you, is you know, why were the seven mentions not recorded? Why did he not record them? But for me, is why did he even mention them? Because it's created a whole industry of the seven funders, and they, they all rattle around them. But John mentions these seven funders, but don't record the purpose of them. In fact, he's told to shut up and not to mention them. It'd have been better for him never to mention them at all in the first place, then we won't be curious. So your own work, read chapters 10 and 11, work out who you think the two witnesses are, and ask yourself about the seven funders, not seven trumpets, seven funders. I hope that's been encouraging for you. We'll stop there and jump into chapter 10 next time. Be blessed, be encouraged. Jesus is on his way. Amen.